As the hitting intensifies, it's 1-0 Montreal. On a power play for another 50 seconds. Richards trying to scoot in there alone. A lock way out of the net. It pinballs to the crease. Score! Mike Richards! The Flyer captain is announcing his presence as the alpha male early in this one. Big hit. Sets up that cranker from Colburn, the defenseman, joining the attack. They win a puck deep in their own zone. Hammerleck and, and the goaltender Halak collide. Oh, did they ever. And it's a tap-in for Richards. Everybody, it's Isaiah, and I'm here with Chef B, who's going to tell us about one of our sponsors here. Chef? Yeah, OMB Podcast is now brought to you by Summit Public Adjusters. The winter months can be especially hard on our homes, from roof damage to peeling siding to frozen pipes and toilet overflows. Call Summit Public Adjusters before you call your insurance company. Dealing with your insurance company can be stressful and confusing. Let Summit Public Adjusters take the stress out of the claim process by having our guys work for you. Get the most for your money and your repairs. The next time the big snow or the rain leaves you with some home damage, contact us for a free consultation. Summit Public Adjusters are licensed in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Learn more at summitpublicadjusters.com or call 215-752-0560. Just tell them that the chef sent you. Yeah, what was that number again, chef? 215-752-0560. That's terrific. All right, we're going to carry on with the rest of our show. Hey, everybody. It's Isaiah. Just before you listen to the show we recorded with Amy Johnson, we just wanted to put out a statement with a show that's coming out over this weekend, recognizing and acknowledging the passing of Johnny and Matthew Goudreau, where a driver irresponsibly ran them down and it's a real shock to the Delaware Valley and the the entire hockey world at large. We were not aware of it, obviously. So if you're listening to this, it was recorded the night before. We didn't want a show to be published and come out without acknowledging their contributions to local hockey and Johnny's uh, fine accomplishments at the college level and the NHL. So enjoy tonight's show as we pay tribute to Johnny Goudreau, his brother Matthew, and send our condolences to the Goudreau family. On to the show. And we are back. It is Isaiah. Yes, we're back for an OMB special. We have a special guest with us to talk about this crazy phenomenon that has popped up, I think, really over the last year or so between the Montreal Canadian fan base and the Philadelphia Flyers, particularly their prospects concerning uh, Matt Vainmichkov, who was there for the Canadians. And there's all kinds of stories about whether they could have taken him and the fan response. And then you had a, a prospect pundit weigh in. And I think he, you know, poured uh, gasoline on the fire. And, that, and that's that's kind of where we're at right now. So uh, we're brought to you by FlyersNittyGritty.com and Jim's South Street. And as we mentioned on our previous show, which we just put out not too long ago um, with uh, Lyle Richardson from Spectres Hockey, we went around the league. The Great Dan Silver is still over in the land of the rising sun on work assignment. You can catch him at DSilver88. But with me tonight to talk about this interesting topic with our guest coming on directly is 
shift to the left B. Say hello to the folks. Hey, guys. Hey, Dan, over overseas. He's really killing it over there. That sushi never had a chance. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So just before we uh, bring on Amy Johnson from uh, Rocket Sports, just to remind people, uh, Jim's South Street is back, 400 South Street, 40 years of the best cheesesteaks and hoagies and fries in the grandest Philadelphia tradition. You know you want one. And if you live down near there, go to Grubhub, DoorDash, whatever it takes to get that delicious food to your door. Jim's South Street, 400 South Street in Philadelphia, PA. Without any further ado, Abs Laval Rocket correspondent at Rocket Sports, also with the Press Zone and on YouTube with the Rocket Hockey Report. Back with us, returning to the OMB podcast, Amy Johnson. Welcome aboard. Wow. Well, well, thank you so much. Great to be back with you guys. That was quite an introduction. And now I'm, I'm, I got to say, I'm salivating now because I, I'm completely free plug. I love gyms. Love love me a steak from gyms. I have not had a steak sandwich from gyms in entirely too long, and now I feel like I need to go get one. <laughs> oh, that's that's fantastic. I, well, I'm down in Florida, so you can imagine I haven't been uh, up that way in a couple of years. So, yeah. So the the Flyers kind of had a mini rivalry, Amy, with the Montreal Canadiens that in terms of their prospects, this is off mm-hmm. the ice. This is prospectively what could happen when the teams meet and they're they're at the draft and the Flyers pass on Cole Caulfield back in 2019 and go with mm-hmm. Cam York. And that's kind of like a minor thing. But uh, as your introduction indicates, you follow the, the Habs and their prospects and the Val Rocket. You see these guys developing. You talk about it all the time. How do Canadians feel about the prospect pool that they have and the direction that they're going well i think uh i i I have to say that once kent hughes and jeff gordon took over the ship um jeff gordon has such a proven track record on on building from within with his tenure with the new york rangers and what he we see now you know the the rangers that are that are successful right now are thanks to what Jeff Gordon did when he was there, even though he's not been there for a little while. Um, at least in part that that's the case. Uh, and he's working that magic again with Kent Hughes. I think he's found a great partner. Um, he, he and Kent Hughes work really well together. And I think that they, now that they have got the entire organization on board with this development first mindset, um, I think they are really making strides. I think they are very pleased with how they've been doing. Um, their last couple of drafts have been a boon. Um, you know, yes, David Reinbacher was raised some eye- eyebrows when when he was taken instead of Meechkoff, but I think that they are still solidly behind that pick. I think he's just a bit more, he's going to be a little longer in the process, but I th- I think that they are, uh, pleased with where they are at. I think they are pleased with the progress. I think they are pleased with the pool that they have, whether they are starting to come into professional hockey at the AHL level or if they're still in junior or NCAA or playing, excuse me, overseas. Um, and in fact, I believe the Athletic just put out uh, their prospect pipeline rankings for 2024. And and the Athletic has the Canadian sitting at number six. In terms of prospect pipelines, which is, I'm sure, you know, Ken Hughes and Jeff Gordon don't need the athletic to pat them on the back, but but that's the kind of media response that I think that they will be pleased with. That that they've they've really focused on prospects and focused on development and player development, and it's it's starting to show. Yeah, I mean, EP Rinkside has um, the Flyers and the Habs well represented in their top hundred. The Flyers have five prospects. The Habs have seven. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot to like. Um, a chef, why don't you weigh in on something before we get to the heart of the matter here? Dig into the oh, oh. Uh, juicy part of the uh, filet. <laughs> That's right. So I wanted, I wanted to ask, too, because it, it's been the, the, the pick of contention when they pass on Mitchkoff. I mean, does Habs fan base in general, do they think that he's going to blossom into a number one defenseman? Or are they still still 
on the edge there. They're still hedging their bets. And I, I think I think with Demidoff now, it's kind of taking the pressure off of him to be that that superstar. Or I mean, if, from an outsider looking in, obviously we're not we're not locked in like you guys are in Montreal. It's a great question. Um, and you're asking from the from a fan's perspective what what the fan base yeah. is is kind of reading. I think I think the fans have been so starved for success in Montreal for so long. Um, the fact that, you know, they they don't like to be reminded that it's been since 1993 that the Habs have won a cup. Um, you know, and it's that's a long time for one of the most decorated or the most decorated franchise in NHL history. Um, and they're they've been starved for a superstar, they've been starved for that, you know, the 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 sparkly, shiny player that's you know, which is why they they embraced Caulfield so much, because Caulfield was one of the ones that was just supposed to be this dynamite, dynamic, exciting player. And I think they wanted that in Meechkoff. Um, but choosing Reinbacher was obviously the direct, you know, solidifying that decor was something that Kent Hughes and Jeff Gordon obviously wanted to do. And I think the fan base has warmed up to Reinbacher. Um, he's certainly, I don't think they have the expectations that he's going to be, you know, a, a, a splashy superstar like a Slavkovsky is. Um, and I do agree with you that I think that Demidov is going to take some of that pressure off him to be a superstar. Demidov is going to be, you know, <laughs> when you think about a top six or even a top line at some point with, um, you know, a Caulfield, a Demidov, and a Slavkovsky, that's a lot of personality <laughs> hanging yeah, out on that top amazing. line. And and the fans are going to be so wrapped up in that that I think that whatever successes David Reinbacher have are just going to be kind of candy on top of it. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it, Amy, is that they whiffed on some high-profile picks in the past where and and I don't know if uh, Kokaniemi is necessarily a whiff, but he was overdrafted. It put him, the player and the organization in a tough spot. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about this new regime doing things a certain way, but the fans tend not to think in those terms. <laughs> so, and I think that's kind of with that recency bias, if you want to call it that, maybe sparked a lot of the angst among the fan base. I think so. Um, the fortunate thing, I think, is that not only are the fans excited about the likes of Caulfield and Slavkovsky and they like Nick Suzuki and now you've got Demidoff on the horizon. Not only are they excited about those guys, the fans seem to be genuinely bought in with Kent Hughes and Jeff Gordon as as the leadership team. And so I think where, whereas it was the complete opposite in the Mark Bergevin regime. Uh, you know, Bergy had lost all faith with the fan base. Um, and and so every choice that he made was was difficult to sell to the fans, whereas I think it's the opposite now with Hughes and Gordon. I think that the fans are willing to trust that they are making the right decisions because they like the decisions or at least they like how the decisions that the, the, the executive team is making are turning out. And so I think that helps the fans then accept that they need to be a little patient during this rebuild that they're not out of the rebuild yet. They're making steps, they're making progress, but don't get ahead of yourself. And I, th I think the fact that they seem to be bought in with the GM and with Jeff Gordon um, has helped that at least to some degree. Now I, I can definitely understand that. So why don't we go back to that fateful night in 2023 when there for the taking was Matt Vey Michkov from the Montreal perspective, was there a thought that Michkov maybe relayed to them that he was not enthusiastic about coming to Montreal? Was that did that weigh into their calculus? Was it the geopolitical situation that made them nervous? A combination of those two? Like, what would you what would you say about that? I'm not sure that there was any flagrant hesitation, at least that I've heard, um, on Michkov not wanting to come to Montreal. I think geopolitically, 
it played for all 32 franchises, just how difficult it's been to scout players in Russia um, the last couple of years. Um, also, you know, at that time, it was still question marks as to whether or not any Russian players would be permitted to leave the country. You know, so you're, you're mm -hmm. starting to then have to worry about if I want this player, even though I haven't been able to really scout him in person, if I get him, is he even going to be able to get here in the next year or two years or three years? So I think geopolitically for every GM, that had to be a question that was taken into consideration. I completely applaud Danny Breer and how how they maneuvered that entire uh, progress and process with with Mechoff, um and, and how they've gotten him here stateside now. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I, you know, I think it came down more to what Hughes and Gordon and their long term plan for the organization was. And for whatever reason, I believe that they just felt that getting a, if, for whatever. And, and I will admit I was baffled at the time. I mean, it was the draft of, you know, high skilled forwards and they took. A defenseman and mm -hmm. you know <laughs> this time around it was kind of the opposite and and they got to meet off instead but um you know so while even even for myself at the time i i was like okay this is a this is not the big splashy choice but let's let's see what happens um and i think that he's gonna spend i think reinbacher is gonna spend a, a good stint in laval this year i don't think he's gonna make the opening night roster for the nhl i think he's got plenty of learning to do um, but I think that Hughes not taking Michkov um, was probably more of, of an organizational priority, just where where Michkov versus a defenseman would fit out more more so than than any other outside influence. So looking at the perspective, the Canadians brass is looking at their depth chart, thinking about their trajectory and in trying to anticipate who's going to be coming out and how they have prospective drafts down the road, they just said, you know what, it all meets in the middle here, and Reinbacher really is, is you know, the pick for us. And, you know, Amy, it's, it's, it's interesting that the, the year prior, the Flyers took Cutter Gauthier, mm -hmm. and I was on board with taking, I think it was um, David Yurichek, who I mm -hmm. thought would have been a better player who's not that dissimilar from Reinbacher. No. So I, we, we took, in other words, we took the flashy scorer. So I think maybe an understated perspective here is the flyer fan thinking, yeah, the Canadians did kind of what the, the opposite of what the flyers did the year prior, even though Gauthier is probably not at the level that Michkov was thought of. But right. Gauthier also didn't have, at that time, we didn't know, but didn't have the the shadows hanging over him in terms of the things we talked about with geopolitical situation and right. uh, concern about that. So it's just a little twist on the whole thing that a lot of people forget because, you know, obviously Gauthier ended up not working out. And mm -hmm. at this point, as a Flyer fan, I'd rather have David Juracek than Jamie Drysdale to be all in all frankness yeah and, and your check is very similar to Reinbacher so maybe there's some there's some irony that's lost uh chef <laughs> I want to make I want to draw this comparison now because we'll probably get to it in a minute anyway I think these these both these franchises are trending up I think mm -hmm. they've got a good start a base next year's draft I I think it's going to be pretty good uh for both teams, because I don't expect either one of these teams to jump any higher than they were. If not, if not, the rest of the league got better around them. And although they made their moves, but I think they're going to be linked forever because of the, you know, the passing over the Cole Caulfield, you know, and, and, and now with Demidoff, I, I want to say this for these two teams in a couple, like they're going to hit probably together when they're both their teams are matured and if it works out for both of them, they're going to be uh, rivals. I do believe this mm -hmm. could be the start of something. Now, obviously judging by a couple, you know, what we talked about already flyers, some, a lot of flyers fans didn't even notice happened that we were rivals. So it already started, <laughs> but uh, I, I liken it to uh, 
when uh, Sheldon on Big Bang Theory was, you know, Will Wheaton is, was his mortal enemy, and he went, oh, well, you know, it doesn't take up too much of your time here. So I'm kind of comparing it to that. But is this something down the line now? It could could this keep developing over the years based on these these controversial picks that each team has done? And if, like, Mitch Goff does great and then Demidoff has a setback or, you know, Cam York turns out to be like a great NHL defenseman and maybe Caulfield's just mediocre or whatever. Can you see these two franchises like duking it out like three years down the line? I I absolutely think that's that's a very good possibility. Um, These two fan bases like to jibe each other. Um, I mean, I have to give full credit to. Uh, the fans in the Wells Fargo Center, any, anytime the Canadians visit, who break out the Ole Ole Ole, um, you know, <laughs> the, the taunting of the Ole song is is fabulously known. Um, and so I have to say, as you know, when my journalist hat is off and I am a Flyers fan, which is the team that I am a fan of when I am just watching hockey for fun. I, you know, I love to hear the Ole song in in the Wells Fargo Center. Um, the Canadians fans, you know, they like to lord the, oh, you took Cam York, we got Cole Caulfield. They love they love to be able to pull that out, of course. Um, and I'm sure, you know, the the Demidoff pick is, is going to be right there as well. I mean, this is a rivalry that's already had, I mean, it's got some, it's got some history to it if we go back to the 70s and 80s. It's got a little bit of history. When you, when you look at, while it wasn't Montreal in terms of the Canadians, it was the Nordique, but it was the province of Quebec. There was the whole Eric Lindros mess. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, which, so the people of Quebec take that personally, whether they were Nordique fans or Canadians fans at this point, uh, you know, with the Nordique not around anymore. Um, even going back to the playoffs during the bubble when the Flyers and the Canadians met in what was it the first round um and the flyers and the flyers ousted the canadian that was a that was a bitter game that was that was <laughs> that was not a that was not a friendly game um or a series that was played and so i think all the all the ingredients i'll use a a chef pun there all the ingredients for a really yeah. tasty rivalry entree are right there um you know, in, in, for the making things that have already kind of been feeding into it over the years. And I think this new kind of unspoken prospect rivalry is just going to add a little bit more to that. And, and yeah, when, when these prospects are are coming into their own in the next couple of seasons and you get those head to head matchups, I think they're going to be pretty, pretty exciting to watch. Yeah. I, 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 let's really dig into it now. So that Mitch Koff is taken, Ryan back, Ryan back has been taken and the Flyers get Mitch Koff. And, and the, the angst uh, is on social media from the Habs fans is, is going crazy. And it just developed into something that was almost toxic. And then a very well-known uh, pundit, a draft pundit, poured gasoline on that fire. And it got to the point where his bias was so clear and he's from recruits.ca. I don't, I don't feel like, you know, calling the guy out. Everybody knows who it is. And it, it kind of led to a point, Amy, where on a podcast and it, it came out in a tweet where he talked about, yeah, I said the quiet part out loud. I, I, if it came down to a choice between wanting Mitch Cobb to fill the net this year or to struggle, I'd prefer his struggles. And it's just, it's it's all about making the Reinbacher pick more acceptable to give Reinbacher more time. I don't think he's rooting against Mitchkoff in general for his whole career, but he's just like until the pressure dies down on Reinbacher, and, and defensemen take longer. Everybody knows that. Mm-hmm. Mitchkoff struggle. And it, like I can't I can't buy this guy's draft guide anymore. I mean his objectivity is like in the toilet. And the fans just like fed into that. And he kind of got this whole thing really started. Not that they needed it. It's just, and it's crazy. I've never really seen anything quite like it, except maybe like you mentioned earlier, 
the whole thing with Eric Lindros, but th that was a rejection by the player mm -hmm. of an organization. That's right. Not, uh, and, and how they ran their business. And of course, they, they weren't, I mean, had tremendous talent that, that accrued from all the, uh, the assets they got back from Lindros, but they didn't win anything until uh, they went to Colorado and got Patrick Wally anyway. So yeah, it, yeah, it's really, it, it got to a point where it's, it's farcical, really. I mean, just my my opinion. I, uh, I'll i I'll say this first. This is, un, unfortunately, there's, there's a pattern that sometimes happens in the mainstream. I mean, everyone knows, I think it's pretty well known league wide and probably globally um, that Montreal is one of the most high pressure markets to play in if you're going to play in the NHL. Part of that comes from the fan base. Part of that comes from the media. Um, and the mainstream media, Montreal, is can be relentless. Um, and they can also be very opinionated. And the fans many times buy into those opinions, uh, whether they have gone to the effort of trying to research or or figure out for themselves if those opinions are actually based in merit or not um and that's part of the reason why us here at rocket sports media as independent media have done what we've done for the last 15 years is trying to bring objective outside you know looking trying trying to take all of that favoritism out of the montreal media landscape and and giving fans a place to say we're going to we're going to judge people like here at rock sports it's a meritocracy when we when we analyze athletes it is it is based on merit it is not based on on anything else um in terms of this Michkov versus reinbacher and the 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 tweet you're referencing and and anyone in general that kind of puts those kinds of feelings out there i say listen whatever david reinbacher is going to achieve or not achieve has absolutely nothing to do with matt vemichkov or anybody else in the nhl and it is not matt vemichkov or any of the other 31 nhl franchises responsibilities for david reinbacher to, to be successful so i you know I just don't see a point in hoping that uh, one prospect struggles so it doesn't so they don't outshine an, 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 a different prospect in a different franchise that just isn't like to me that just doesn't even make sense. So I just kind of don't pay attention to it. But, you know, I I hope Matt Vemichkov fills the net because I think that would be an incredible story for Matt Vemichkov and the Philadelphia Flyers and their fans. And I hope David Reinbacher proves me wrong and only spends maybe a few weeks in Laval because he's so good they have to call him up like you know for me I prefer as a journalist to just root for people to succeed and and based off of their own work ethic based off their own talent based off of their own skill and and it's unfortunate that it's it's part of the reason why I don't spend a whole lot of time on social media anymore, unfortunately, because it's just become this place where people feel the feel free to say whatever they want. Um, and it's usually not very nice. And I don't know. I just um, I think I think that David Reinbacher's performance this season, wherever he plays, should be solely compared to David Reinbacher and the other defensemen that are in the Canadians organization and full stop. It ends there. Montreal, it, it, you, you said it's a, it's a hard place to play hockey in. It's one of it. To, forget that. If you compared, there are certain cities and certain franchises out there that it transcend all sports. I mean, like, you know, you like, it's like Yankees, you know, whether, mm -hmm. you know, you know, and, and I always felt that Montreal and even Toronto to a, uh, to a, a respect, they are one of the hardest franchises to play for in any sport because of the legacy and everything that's involved in there. And rooting for your players or other players not to do well, that's not a good story. The good story and, and to get everybody talking is when they have these great seasons and they and you take a skilled player and you throw him into an environment and he thrives i'd much rather 
write or read or listen to a story about a player thriving, then, oh, I told you so. Like, nobody wants the negative Nellies in their lives, you know? You know, it's, it's just one of those things, you know? So I, I think to your point, like, it, it, it shouldn't be – rooting for a guy to fail because that's not the good story and it's not the good result for your franchise anyway. And that's, yes, you want feel good stories. Um, That's what, you know, that's what we want. We've always uh, advocated for good people, good character, all in terms of athletes that we cover um, and, and, you know, looking beyond just the stat sheet, what kind of work ethic do they have? What, uh, you know, what kind of, of, of background are they bringing what what is their off ice work ethic look like as well and those types of things and hey i i'm the first to say you know everyone is entitled to their opinion i will never i'm i'm never never ever would be someone that would say oh i don't like what you said because you know you just i disagree with you everybody has their own opinion and they're free to say whatever whatever they want and i'm perfectly okay with that um just in my it for, to answer your question in in my sphere uh only rooting for success for prospects and hopefully everybody's happy that way <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely i i think and and then we come to 24 where it was the flyers fans that really kind of needed the alka seltzer and <laughs> after they passed on zeke boyum and uh constant hellenius and, and yeah decided to go with the Jet Lachenko, who's a bit more of a projection in terms of what his ceiling might be. And the Canadians basically salved the wound of last year by taking Ivan Demidov, who has a very similar uh, game to uh, Matt Vay Mishkov and mm-hmm. maybe he's equal down the road. We don't know. We really don't. Um, you know, he's he certainly has a terrific personality in any of his media availabilities. He's obviously very excited. He's got um, he's got some pretty exceptional skill. Uh, now it's time to see, you know, what he does for for this year. Is he is he, you know, playing with SKA St. Petersburg or the junior team? Uh, if he's if he plays, you know, as as Kent Hughes has said, uh, if he's playing in St. Petersburg in the KHL, this is a quote from Kent Hughes. He says, quote, I think it's a great environment for him for a year. We drafted him understanding that he had another year and that was never going to deter us. Um, and that comes right off of uh, an NHL.com article by Sean Farrell, um, that quote. And so he is an exciting player they knew that it wasn't going to be immediately sign him to an entry level deal and try to bring him here, let him cook for another year over in Russia in the KHL. Um, and yeah, I agree. I think that he's got a lot of the things that um, fans and and scouts find attractive about Matt Vimichkov's game. I think they're they're seeing the same types of of special things happening with Ivan Dimitrov's game. Um, and I think it's going to be fascinating when when the two of them are finally playing on North American ice. Um, those that I think comparing those two players, I think, will be a much more balanced and fair comparison to make of two prospects when both I, Demidoff yeah. and Michkov are playing on North American ice and comparing the two of them side by side. That's that's a prospect on prospect comparison that I'm happy to make. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And according to Hockey News Hub, who have been fairly reliable, uh, Roman Rutenberg, who runs that club, said that uh, Ivan Demidov will play for for SKA for the first game of their regular season. So that's great. Um, yeah. So it, whether that continues, we'll see. It looks like he's off to a great start. I I, I wish him all the best. Yeah, I can't root against the guy just because I want to my team to pick him, you know, I'm just, <laughs> not, like I'm not going to root against Hellenius or Z Boyum either, you know? So, um, Cut, that, well, well, Isaiah, Cutter Gauthier is a different story though. Or as we, I, we've I called him I now. I can't root Twitter. against him. I just, I, I hope. You just that can't what, root for him. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm not going to root for him. And I think the thing <laughs> is, I knew Gauthier was going to go through a learning process and if he got away from Tortorella, he got a, he walked right into Torch Jr. in, in Cronin in a- Anaheim. That guy's a hard case, too. So um, mm-hmm. there's a little bit of lazy in Gauthier's game. Yes. He's got a little bit of uh, BMOC 
campus thing <laughs> going on there. And he's in for a rude awakening. But he's a hell of a prospect, and he's going to score a lot of goals, I think. But, uh, Amy, I just wanted to move over and, and, and just discuss, like, some of the top draft picks that the, the Canadians have made because I think they've done a really good job since Caulfield in 19. You look at uh, Caden Gooley. Who just Logan signed Malio, a really that, big what, extension. Yeah, yeah. Logan Malio, okay, he had some – there's some off-ice issues there in terms of the, the, a little bit of a controversy. He was taking the end of the uh, first round. And Owen Beck and Lane uh, Hudson look like really good picks. We talked about Reinbacher and uh, uh, Michael Hage. Uh, how, is that how you pronounce it? Um, yes, Michael Hage. Uh, is a center that was drafted uh, 21st overall. And we talked about earlier about the athletic and EP ring size rankings. And, and in all frankness, I don't think the Flyers have as many prospects that are as highly rated right now, even if you include uh, Mitchkoff into the bargain. So I, I think the Canadians fans should really concentrate on w- what's what's good. And I think the meetup is going to help them do that. But it doesn't stop these Reddit types putting out these tweets uh, some, <laughs> that, that have this um, advertisement or whatever you want to call it uh, for the exhibition game coming up between the Canadians in Montreal and the Flyers on September 23rd. And it, it has a picture of a Flyers player kind of trapped down on the ice at, with the extended arm of the Canadian player uh, and his other arm is with, you know, uh, rearing his fist back as if they're just pushing the flyers around. And that's really funny because, you know, because I come from a a period where the Broad Street bullies are going to push around the Canadians. And it was Larry Robinson to the rescue, standing up to Dave (laughs) Schultz, going all the way back to the 70s. Now it's like, it's a role reversal here. You know, it's just like revenge for uh, John Van Boxmere in 1974. It's crazy. Absolutely. Well, hey, I've got my, I've got my autographed uh, Dave the Hammer Schultz uh, figure right behind me on the shelf here. Uh, so absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, Broad Street Bully Days. Uh, and, and it's it's funny that, you know, back in that era, highly skilled teams like the Canadians and their fan base didn't like the brute force physicality of the broad street bullies they were you know they the flyers were looked down upon for playing that kind of hockey and then everybody tried to respond to it and and i i I find it interesting now that um there are some sections of the fan base that would like to they seem to it's it's like they've flipped the switch the script now that that they want not that they want to be broad street bully-esque but that that whole physicality of, you know, we're going to take it to them. They love Arbor Jack eye in Montreal. Yeah. They love Michael Pizzetta in Montreal. And those two guys go toe to toe with all of the league's toughest, toughest characters. Um, and, and so it's interesting to me that that's become a part of, of what the fan base in Montreal wants. Yeah, it is. But I think one of the other things too, is that, you guys were in the finals and had that run and then it all just kind of came tumbling down and you had the management change, but I like some of the pieces that were, were here. And I like some of the things, Mm -hmm. the players they brought in, you know, taking advantage of who was it who gave up on Kirby doc. Was it Chicago? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. And it it just getting good young players that could mm-hmm. still fit within their timeline. And I, I think we're a little jealous in that way that the Flyers haven't done a little bit more of that. And I, well, there's been Kirby doc. There's been Alex Newhook. There's been Sean mm-hmm. Monaghan. Uh, now, he, now they're going to try, you know, is Kent Hughes pulling, trying to pull a fourth coup with oh, getting with Patrick, Patrick Lina. Lina. Um, and we'll, we'll see how that pans out. But yes, that has been a key part of the rebuild is bringing in uh, young young talent that has a ton of upside and is and and hasn't yet reached their potential to see what they can do and and many of them have flourished so far if they can stay healthy um and as far as the prospect pool yeah i mean logan mayu and lane hudson are absolutely going to compete for an nhl roster spot for opening night uh at training camp um lane hudson is just pure raw talent logan mayu um has has just he absolutely 
dominated in the AHL last year. Uh, he was the all-star representative for Laval last year. Uh, he was, he, he was leading, not just rookie defensemen, but all defensemen in the league in a number of different categories at different points throughout the season. Uh, he just had an absolutely outstanding season in Laval and even the game that he got called up. Uh, he, he got called up to play the final game of the regular season. He looked like he fit right in. So he and Lane Hudson are absolutely going to compete uh, for a roster spot. Owen Beck on, on the forward side of things. Uh, I think that Beck will probably play in Laval, but he could be a call-up option for injury. And if he's, if he's anything like he's been uh, thus far in, in his career, you know, he might make that stick if he gets a call up. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an exciting time for, for Montreal Canadiens fans because the prospect pool is, is really, is really thick with a lot of talent. And you have a number one center, something we don't have. Uh, Chef. Yeah. Yeah. Jealous about that to, to be sure. Mm-hmm. Now my uh, Patrick line, I mean, we haven't brought him up yet uh, with the trade and all. How is he going to be received there? I mean, are are Habs fans excited about it at least? I mean, definitely there's potential there, but it, you know, as we said earlier with with Gauthier being lazy, I mean, there's there's definitely knocks on his, I guess not necessarily his skill, but his is I guess his application of his skill. So how are how how is Montreal uh, excited about this? I think they're excited about it. Um his his press conference was probably one of the most and and i was actually speaking with um rick stevens who's who's our founder here at rocket sports about this and we both agreed that it was probably the most engaged we have ever heard patrick lina in a in a press availability in an interview situation like that dating back to when he was in winnipeg um and i think i think the fans first of all the price was absolutely right. Kent Hughes did not give up much to get Patrick Lina. He gave Wait, up Jordan Harris. He gave up Jordan Harris, who Jordan Harris is a solid young defenseman in a logjam of solid young defensemen in Montreal. So I'm actually happy for Jordan Harris. I hope this means he's going to get more of an opportunity to play and grow. Um, but for the for the Habs fans, okay, that's all they had to give up was Jordan Harris. To get Patrick Lina and a draft pick for next year, Patrick Lina, I think a lot of the perception of of any issues with Patrick Lina, I think stem from a place where he himself. There are definitely hockey players who play more in their head than others, and I think that Patrick Lina is one of them. And I think that now that he has taken the time to work on himself, um, away from the rink. I was really, I was really impressed with some of the things that he said in his, in his press availability upon news of the trade of just how, how content and at peace within, within himself he is at at this stage. Um, And I think that's going to translate. Uh, I think the big bright lights of Montreal are going to challenge him in a good way. I think he's going to rise to that occasion um, and I, I, I think that Habs fans are, are excited about, I think they're cautiously optimistic. Um, I think they're excited about what could be, they just want to wait to see him play a couple of games before they fully invest in getting super excited. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Makes sense. So in, in goal this year, it's, um, Sam Montebal and Ken Primo are they the two best goalies they have right now? Is there somebody emerging in, in the prospect pool? As far as what they have right now, that's that's probably going to be the tandem. Jakob Dobish is the starting goaltender in Laval. He played a full season there last year. It was his rookie rookie year. Um, and I think Jakob Dobish is, is going to knock on the door sooner rather than later at the NHL level, but it's going to take a little bit of time. Um, He unfortunately wasn't helped by the fact that they had not the right veteran uh, in tandem with him for the first few months in Laval last year. And so they went through their first, you know, through December last year for Laval was absolutely dismal. Um, I mean, they, they, 
they went on lengthy losing streaks um, and it was it was difficult. And a lot of that was resting on Dobish's shoulders because he didn't have the ability to, you know, take a night off and concentrate on learning because the guy that they had as 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 his tandem partner was also not getting it done. So mm. once once they made a switch midseason, brought in Casimir Cascasuo, who had a bit more stability in between the pipes. Uh, we saw an immediate change in Jakob Dobish's performance as well, because he was then able to just focus on the task at hand and learning how to be a North American pro pro goaltender. Um, and he played exceptionally well uh, in the second half of the season. So he's not quite ready yet, but, but I, he's got, he's got a lot of good base talent there. A lot of good skill. He's big, he's a big kid. Um and he he can he can make the net look very small. <laughs> so yes, I I think uh, I think that at some point he's going to come knocking on the door, um, and we'll see if it's going to be Montembo or Primo who's going to get a little nervous about his progression. About Primo, well, of course he's one of my his dad is one of my favorite all time flyers. What what is realistically? I mean he's 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 what twenty five now twenty six somewhere around in there and uh what's his realistically what are his chances i mean the, a couple games that we see them obviously you're going to see them more than us but a couple games you see i mean look he, i think he beat the flyers in one game uh so i mean what's his future I, even if it's not with montreal is he a legitimate uh, nhl goalie or is he reckoned to be a backup for his career or maybe go back to the minors mm, that is that's a difficult question, believe it or not. Uh, having covered his, having covered his entire pro career, ever since 2019-20 when he when he would turn pro, and spent most of that season in Laval, um, he's had. I w- I will say this about Caden Primo. This past season, he actually started to look more confident when he was playing. NHL games this past season. Maybe that's because he wasn't splitting his time between the AHL and the NHL last year. But at, up until that point, by and far, he performed hands down better in the AHL than he did in the NHL. His his performance in the NHL between the years 2019 and and 2023 were, I would say, mostly forgettable. Um, and I'm sure he would want to forget them. Um, it was, it was not good. Um, in the AHL, then he would go down. It it was almost like, you know, there was a lot of times that I think many people were getting worried that he was only going to be one of those players who almost was too good for the AHL, but not good enough yet for the NHL. And what do you do with, with that kind of prospect this past season in Montreal, just being in a tandem with San Montembeau seems to have at least helped his confidence at the NHL level. He ended the season, he he started 23 games. He ended the season uh, with a 299 goals against and a 910 save percentage, which isn't too shabby considering yeah. how he played in the NHL for the years prior to that. So if he can build on that, do I think he can be a starting goaltender in the NHL? I'm not... I'll use my cautiously optimistic phrase again. I'm not convinced that he will be a starting goaltender, but I think if he can build on what he did last year, I think he could find his way to being a decent regular NHL backup. Mm-hmm. That's uh, and that's I hope not, he proves yeah. me. And I hope I will say I hope he proves me wrong. I always yeah, I always like to say yeah. that about a prospect. I hope he proves me wrong. Um just need to see him take that extra step forward this season. Yeah, definitely rooting for him with the the primo name uh, on top of everything yes. else. <laughs> so, uh, Amy, I don't know if we really we really tackled the subject matter to everybody else's satisfaction. There's a lot of fervor out there, but um, I, I did before we wrapped up for the night. I did want to get your opinion on what you think the Flyers, uh, you know what they did this off season and where do you think they're at in their plan and their trajectory? Like what, what's your feeling as a fan pundit, however you want to, you know, describe it. 
Um, I would have to go strictly from fan perspective, which I will sadly admit I don't get to watch as many Flyers games uh, as I used to um, since I usually have to be watching Montreal Canadiens games <laughs> for work. Um, but, you know, I I go back to what I said earlier. Um, I think Danny Briere as GM has probably been one of the best decisions the organization has made in recent years. I have been uh, solidly in favor of, of that trajectory that they had Briere on, even when he was managing the main Mariners in the ECHL, you could see what they were building. Um, many times when I was in the press box for the Lehigh Valley Phantoms, uh, I can't count. It takes more than two hands for me to count how many times a season I would see Danny there in the press box as well just helping to check in on players and prospects and and that type of thing, even while he was managing the main Mariners in the ECHL. Mm -hmm. Um, So I've always been a big believer in his abilities to, to manage a team, his abilities to uh, focus on development and focus on prospects and make the right decision for young players. Um, And I think that's been a, a key part of where the flyers are right now. I think I think they've got some exciting young talent coming through. Um, I, you know, glad to see TK is going to be there. (laughs) Um, You know, there's, there's, I'd like to see them shore up something a little more confidence boosting in net. I think that's probably a place, you know, there's, I know that they've got a couple of guys who are, you know, coming up through through the ranks and so forth and have kind of tested the waters a little bit last season and so forth. And I know it's not their fault that they're in the situation that they're at without, um, you know, with Carter Hart not being with the organization anymore mm-hmm. and so forth. Yeah. But but I'd like to see I'd like to see the organization go after someone with some really solid experience in that to help backstop what what they've got going on in front of them. Um, but I, th- I'm excited about the trajectory they are, they are on as well. I think, I think it's going to be another couple of years of pain, l- very similar to the Montreal Canadiens. Um, I think it's going to be, you know, another couple of years before we can start talking about really competing for a playoff spot, maybe not in this season, maybe next season, or at least going deep into a playoff run. But I, th- I think they're on the right path. I do. I, I think they're on the right path. Okay. And then what if Trent in that path by offering a, uh, professional tryout with uh, E2 McInerney. Now I he's saw a, that <laughs> today. Yeah, I think he's a little insurance, and it might have something to do with uh, Alexei Kolosov, one of their mm-hmm. top goal-tending prospects from Belarus, uh, getting a little bit of cold feet. He had a brief AHL exposure, mm-hmm. and apparently he was a little homesick. And the word is, as he has changed agents to Dan Milstein, that oh. he is unlikely to uh, to come over that they I, their rationale is alexi needs one more year in the khl with dinamo dinamo minsk and then he'll fulfill his contract but that that burns two years out of his entry level it doesn't and the flyers it's like yeah one year was fine but that's uh a yeah. bridge too far so that yeah there are the loggerheads there but no i i hear you there yeah we're, we're worried about center and all that and yes um, yeah, we just don't know how good Lachenko is. So if if he if he was, you know, if he they had taken um oh uh not Lindstrom. Lindstrom's got the bad back. Who's the kid? The um he was I think it was like number seven or eight. Um oh gosh, I can't think of his name, but just in the last draft. A smaller kid would really he's like a better version of Frost. Uh, or he's uh, more, like Boris Barzal, Barzal. I can't think of his name. T J Ginla? Uh, no, he's a center. Um, yeah, oh, teach gotcha. again. Well, teach uh, Berkeley Catton. Yeah, that was him. Yeah, Berkeley Catton. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Again, that might be a center. I've heard that too. So it's not not impossible. Yeah, but Ber- Berkeley Catton would have made us feel better. But you can't complain. So, <laughs> Amy, why don't you tell the folks where they can catch you on social media, even though you're not there a lot, and online, of course. And they catch your podcast on YouTube and everything like that. So the folks can catch up with you and your fine work. Well, I appreciate that. Um, Flyers fans and Habs fans are welcome to follow me on Twitter at Flyers Rule. (laughs) 
I have had that. Uh, I've had. I that. laugh every time I hear it. <laughs> I'm yeah. so glad that you do. I've. There are other Philadelphia sports media folks who, every time I talk to them, they're like, "How did you manage to?" Well, I was on Twitter in 2009, and it was there in the early days, <laughs> and I snagged it, and it's why I haven't changed my name. So yep. Habs fans get really upset when they see my twitter handle because they're like why should we listen to you if you're a flyers person and i just say <laughs> i just i can't change the handle because someone will steal it immediately yes. uh mm. so you can find me at flyers rule i am a flyers fan i cover the canadians and their prospects uh and as if you can't tell from this interview i am all about happy harmony between the two fan bases since i cover one and i'm a fan of the other so you will never have uh, contention in my in my twitter feed so come on come on over and, and give me a follow um and you can find me i work for rocket sports media uh we're an independent uh sports media company and you can find uh my youtube shows for rocket sports at youtube.com slash all habs um you can also just go to inside the canadians.com that's inside the canadians with an e.com Fantastic. Yeah, this is a definitely a Habs Flyers Kumbaya moment. <laughs> it is. is that, and yes. it's probably going to be the last one until the season. <laughs> okay. That's probably right. That's probably so right. We're looking forward to September 23rd, uh, the exhibition game. Remember, it's just an exhibition. I'm not even sure Mitch Kopp's going to play, uh, but in Montreal. And that'll guess that that'll really be the next big event, assuming everybody's healthy. So it's going to be a good one. Yeah, yeah. Amy, th thanks for doing this. Uh, look forward yes. to having you, you on uh, again uh, sometime very soon. I very much appreciate it. It's great talking to both of you. It's been too long, and I'm always happy to catch up with you. Thanks for having me on. You got See it. You thanks, Thank you. Right, take care. Okay, so, Chef, I, I hope uh, people got the uh, red meat that was uh, cooked yeah. uh, rare. Mm -hmm. uh, with that, uh, <laughs> with that discussion that we had, I think it was that was good that we tackled it. I don't know if too many people have really dug into it with uh, somebody from out of town. Yeah. Maybe somebody has. There's so many podcasts you can't keep track. But uh, what, what's your final thought for tonight? Well, my final thought is this: I will say this. I think you should these two franchises. I think are tied together for the next seven to 10 years, just based on the players that were selected. There were always, there are always going to be comparisons, you know, to Caulfield, to York, and now, you know, uh, Mitch Koff to Demi Dolph or, you know, uh, it doesn't matter at this point, you know, they're, they're locked together. And as it goes forward, if you, if you guys, if these two teams keep picking around each other, it, it's going to even fuel the, fires because i think they're go both going to be very good franchises in two to three years and it's going to be exciting to watch and i think the rivalry started here you know uh last year so this is exciting so i can't wait to start the season and uh hey you guys want to argue with me about anything you can catch me chef the left b on twitter or x i'm sorry i keep saying that's a bad habit but you know you can tweet at me whatever you want to do i'll respond i i interact with everybody you got it. And you can find the great Dan Silver on X at DSilver88. And of course, you can follow the OMB Podcast at OMB Puck at OMB Puck on Getter at OMB Podcast at OMB Podcast. And one of a dozen podcast platforms Apple, Spotify, iHeart, TuneIn, Amazon Audible, Deezer. We have a YouTube page. And just plug in there, OMB Podcast. And we have a Facebook page as well. And um, yeah, so we're going to be probably back the week after Labor Day with a, I would imagine, a training camp special. And hopefully the great dance over will be back with us at that time. Until next time, everybody, thanks for listening to this OMB special. Take care.